Flutter's mission statement is to build apps for every screen. While Flutter started out supporting only mobile devices, it has quickly expanded to supporting both web and desktop applications. Flutter has also moved into running on embedded devices such as Google's Nest Hub, Toyota's in-vehicle entertainment systems, and even pro audio devices such as the Medium MIDI foot controller. But is this really supporting apps for every screen? While the use in embed devices is diverse, in the end, all of these embed devices are really just medium to large high resolution touchscreen interfaces that still make use of power hungry system on chips with powerful CPUs and GPUs. But what about smaller, lower powered embedded devices and much smaller screens? Can we still make use of Flutter and Dart to allow us to develop for these other classes of devices? That is a question I set out to answer for myself when I chose to use Dart for a project to build an audio production device called a Groovebox. And I hope the topics I cover here will help others use Dart to bring their embedded projects to life. Now, how did I end up working on this project? With a background as an Android and Flutter developer, I now work as a developer relations engineer at Code Magic, and I am also involved in the community as a Flutter Dart at GDE and GDE organizer. However, none of these involve knowing anything about music production, and I was blissfully unaware of the topic at all until the start of 2021, when I happened to have a conversation on Twitter with Bob Nystrom, and in the midst of COVID lockdowns, I took Bob's words to heart and went down the rabbit hole of learning about electronic music production. So what are groove boxes? Groove boxes are a type of electronic musical instrument that typically combine a drum machine, a synthesizer and or a sampler and a sequencer in a single device. They are designed to allow users to create and manipulate electronic music quickly and easily with some groove boxes including extra features such as mixes and effects processes making them versatile, powerful tools for music production. Because of this ease of use, a lot of electronic music producers and musicians use groove boxes for dynamic live performances, such as the one we are now watching. Most groove boxes also focus heavily on providing hardware controls, dials, buttons, pads and faders for controlling their functionality favoring a very hands-on tactile user interface instead of large screen UIs of mobile and desktop computers. Groove boxes mostly have small, low resolution screens or very basic seven segment LEDs or even no screen at all. For those that aren't familiar with the world of electronic music production, some of these terms may need some explanation. And so I've included a few fun examples from Google's great Chrome Music Lab experiments to help illustrate the concepts. A synthesizer allows the user to play notes and melodies, as well as a variety of controls and parameters for adjusting the sound, with the sound often being generated as one of a combination of simple tones such as square, triangle and sine waves. A drum machine can be thought of as a device that allows defining and then playing back a rhythm or a drum beat with a set of percussion instruments while a sequencer allows you to do something similar, creating sequences of notes to be played by a number of different instruments at different times. For my project of building a DIY groove box, I chose to use an Akai Fire MIDI controller, a device with a large number of these hands-on controls. Because a MIDI controller by itself is simply an I.O. device, like a QWERTY keyboard or a mouse, I needed to pair it with a small embedded system. In my case, this is a Cypede Lychee which uses an all-winner D1 RISC-V CPU. At this point, you may be wondering what a RISC-V CPU is. Unlike ARM CPUs, which are commonplace and used in most phones, tablets, and in many embedded systems, RISC-V is a new CPU architecture, and unlike Intel and ARM, is an open source one. It's now starting to become broad, more broadly available and may become a competitor to ARM in the future in the mobile and embedded space. For my use case, the Lychee development board is important because it's the smallest and lowest powered CPU development board that Dart currently supports, which is important because I intend to mount it in 
the Akai Fire controllers case and power it through a small battery pack. Dart support of RISC-V is however admittedly quite recent, having only been available starting from the Dart 2.17 release in May of 2022. Despite this though, installing and using Dart on a Lychee is similar to using a Raspberry Pi, which is a much more well-known embedded Linux development board. To use Dart on a Lychee, we first need to install Linux on the SD card, and, then, and there are already several Linux versions to choose from, and in the demonstrations here, I'm using a custom third-party Linux build. With that done, you need to set up Wi-Fi networking on the board, and then download and install the Dart SDK zip file from the dart.dev website. I've previously written a blog post about how to get Dart installed on the Lychee, and a link to that will be included in the video description below. Now that we have Dart running on our development board, we can return to the issue of screens. Apart from its large number of RGB LED pads, buttons and dials, the controller I'm using also includes a very small 0.96 inch monochrome OLED screen with a resolution of just 128 by 64 pixels. Now normally to use these little OLED screens you would use the I2C protocol and there are at least three Dart packages on PubDev to choose from to make use of I2C. But in the case of this specific project, the Fire Controller allows drawing to the screen via a MIDI specific extension. And so for this, I can make use of the MIDI Dart package, which uses the Linux MIDI system interface via FFI. I also use the Dart Fire MIDI package that I created, which implements the custom MIDI commands required to interface with the OLED screen on the controller. Although it helps to hide the details of the MIDI protocol for drawing to the OLED screen, the Dart Fire MIDI package intentionally only provides a very unopinionated and very Spartan API, where you need to provide just a list of booleans representing the on and off pixels in order to draw to the OLED screen. So in order to make life easier, I created two other packages called Monochrome Draw and OLED Font 57, which provide APIs to draw shapes and text to the screen and provide a bitmap font to use with them. But even using the Monochrome Draw package still gives us a very low level drawing API and is not the kind of thing that we're used to as Flutter developers. So can Flutter help us here? Well, we need to first remember that Flutter is meant for high resolution screens, driven by the GPUs which Skia, the graphics library used in Flutter expects to be available. And it uses three trees to optimize for performance in order to run smoothly at 60 frames per second. Now, does any of this make sense for our tiny 128 by 64 monochrome screen? Well, no, no, it doesn't. And it's no surprise that Flutter does not work on tiny screens such as these. But while we can't use Flutter as is, can Flutter still help us here? Perhaps it can if we think about what Flutter really is. One way to think of Flutter is of the different components that make it up, as in this diagram. Another is to look at its widget, element, and render trees. But I think from the day-to-day -day developer's point of view, Flutter can be thought of in terms of its widgets and their build methods that we constantly make use of. From this point of view, Flutter, or at least the concepts behind it, can still make sense for us, even on tiny screens. Using a declarative API for our UI still makes sense, as does the associated tree of immutable widgets. Build methods and context for the widgets still make sense, even if we don't have a separate element tree and of course, hot reload is still extremely useful. So if we apply the core principles of Flutter for our tiny screen use case, what could the API look like? Well, here is an example taken from the code for my Groovebox application. It first defines a widget class, which admittedly looks quite different from the Flutter ones we're used to, as it focuses on the functionality required for this particular application to handle input events and draw to the monochrome screen. Having this widget class, I can then subclass it to have an OLED widget and then subclass that for specific types, such as an OLED screen list widget. While the paint method covers the visual output, what about the other part of the UI, the user input? Here again, 
we have a very different situation to all the platforms that Flutter currently supports, where, as I mentioned earlier, even embedded devices have medium to large touchscreens and or QWERTY keyboards and mice or trackpads. But in this case, we only have dials and colored LED buttons and pads. And yet I believe we can still apply Flutter's everything is a widget philosophy here. We can treat buttons, dials and pads all as widgets, especially since most of the buttons and pads even have visual elements of their own, even if they aren't actually being drawn on a screen. In this example code, again taken from my Groovebox application, you can see what I have called hardware widgets, such as this module list, which is a widget for the RGB pad buttons to display a list of instrument sounds currently available for the user to use. Likewise, I have a chromatic keyboard widget, which also extends pad widget and so represents another widget for the RGB pads. Of course, this sets us up for further expansion, allowing, for instance, future widget subclassing pad widget, such as QWERTY keyboard for, well, a QWERTY keyboard, or scale keyboard to say represent notes on a musical scale. Now, you may have noticed that the widget classes I have shown so far aren't using the same API as Flutter and don't quite incorporate all the principles from Flutter that I've mentioned. That's because the architecture for the app has grown organically as I gradually realized while working on the project that these concepts from Flutter could work well here. The latest experimental version of my application has now moved further along. As you can see here, it now uses a top-level run me app method we are familiar with from Flutter. And if you have a look at an example of the top-level widget here, we can now see the use of our old friend the build method, with widgets, with children lists, and there is of course stateful widgets, where I have included built-in support for Riverpod. While looking at the code is useful, I'd like to now demonstrate a few of these widgets in action in my ML2 Groovebox application. Here we can see the pad widgets being displayed on the, the colored pads. We have two widgets here, a color-coded list of available instruments and a musical chromatic keyboard. We can use the list of instruments to select an instrument and then play it back using the chromatic keyboard. We can likewise switch to a different instrument such as the bass indicated on the, with the OLED widget and play it back again using the chromatic keyboard. Here I've zoomed in the camera to better show you the OLED display. I can select a particular instrument by pressing one of the pads because we're, here we're in instrument mode. It shows us the name of the instrument. These dials then display the settings that each dial controls in order. So I can turn the dials to change the various settings that they represent. I can also page through different sets of settings and the dials then control those settings. I can also use the browse button to move into a different mode which selects a different instrument to assign to the pad and I can then scroll through and select from the list. So this is the list view widget allowing us to paginate through an arbitrary set of items and to for instance select a particular one. Given how new and forward looking this is especially the RISC-V support. It's to be expected that there are some issues and problems that I've come across that you should be aware of. Firstly, Dart support for RISC-V is only in the Dart dev channel for now, and there is no Flutter support for Linux on RISC-V, though there is an open issue for adding the support. Secondly, the D1 is a fairly slow CPU, so it is not really suited for on-device development, such as what you might do with a more capable embedded development board, such as the Raspberry Pi 3 or 4. This should not be an issue if we had 
Flutter remote development support the way Flutter supports Android and iOS devices, where your dark code is compiled on your development machine and then pushed and with hot reload or hot restart onto your phone or tablet. Cross compiling with just the Dart SDK could also help with this, but at the moment is not supported by Dart, though again there is an open issue in the Dart issue tracker for this. Despite the issues, not only the future, but even the present looks bright for this kind of use of Dart and eventually Flutter. Dart is available today for RISC-V and in my testing so far works well. The SIP Lychee development boards are available and reasonably priced, unlike for instance Raspberry Pi 4s, which are still almost impossible to obtain even now in early 2023. OS support is growing for RISC-V, and for instance, Ubuntu now has official support for the Lychee board. Small standalone OLED screens, such as the one in the Fire Controller, are very cheap and readily available on eBay and online electronic suppliers. And there is support in Dart package ecosystem to use these little screens. Overall, I found the combination of Dart and the embedded hardware I've shown here is ready today for hobbyist or prototyping use. So why not have a go and see what you can build with it? Finally, before I finish up, I want to thank Tiny Wires, aka Bob Nystrom from the Dart team for permission to use his wonderful piece, Neonate, and for getting me hooked on electronic music making. Noopcat, aka Suze Hinton, an awesome developer and an old friend who created the original TypeScript modules that I ported to Dart to make my monochrome, draw, and OLED fit font 57 packages. Invisible Wrench, aka Morton, Mortensen, the creator of the Midium Flutter-based MIDI controller for adding the initial support for MIDI on Linux to his Flutter plugin. Andreas Jung for making available the custom Linux build for the Sci-Fi Lychee that I used. Night Radio, aka Alexander Zolotov for the Lib Sunvox library I used for the ML2's audio engine. And finally, Paul Curtis from Sega for publishing a series of blog posts about his decoding of the Akai Fire MIDI implementation. You'll be able to find the slides with links to all the resources mentioned in this video in the description below. Thank you for watching.